Hello friends, I'm making this video to discuss about the preparation strategy for section one FRCS urology. I have been getting a lot of queries these days regarding how to approach this section one urology exam since there is not much guidance available. So this is going to help you in your preparation. And also we are going to talk about how the course that we are offering is going to help you in your preparation. So with the next five to 10 minutes, we will be talking about the eligibility criteria of the exam, the exam pattern, the books and the guides, most of us are aware of that. Regarding the course that we are offering, the some tips and tricks, which is important on the day of the exam and your preparation strategy. And we'll try to solve some of the questions and we'll see how to read and how to apply the knowledge that we have in solving the questions. So the first thing we are going to talk about is the eligibility criteria. So whether you appear for the international exam or the UK based exam, the eligibility criteria is always a six year of experience after your primary medical qualification. That is the first prerequisite. Second, you must have an MRCS exam. You must have qualified it. And this has been added over the last one year. Okay. So you must have an MRCS and a six years post your primary medical qualification. You must have an adequate knowledge and skill in urology and that you have to submit a logbook and you must get three references from your referees and for your international exam you don't need your referees to have an frcs but when you're appearing for your uk based exam that is the jcie format there you need to have more detailed references from your referees in uk okay so regarding the number of attempts you have four attempts for your section one and if you look at this difference between your international exam and your UK based exam, for your international exam, section one, you have a maximum of four attempts. Okay. However, in your JCI UK based exams, you have a maximum of four attempts, but you have to complete that within two years of your first attempt. Okay. Because there are more frequent exams being held in UK. Therefore, this is a possibility that you have to appear within a two year period only. So once we understand the eligibility criteria of this exam, you need to understand that the MRC is, is a mandatory. So when you're going to apply, go through the application, they're going to ask you which MRC is college, which Royal College you are affiliated to. And that is a prerequisite to complete your application. Otherwise, you won't be able to proceed for your further application. To look at the exam pattern, so whether it's a intercollegiate or the international exam you are going to face 240 questions over four and a half hours okay with the break in between the break is usually of an hour and so your total duration of the exam is going to be five and a half hours okay it's a long day long exam but you're going to have 240 questions you get adequate time for each question so time shortage has never been a problem for most of the candidates only thing is you need to read the question thoroughly and you really should make sure that you go through the images. Sometimes the images are, you need to get a click and then the images are revealed. So make sure you don't forget to see the images before you mark an answer. Okay. So this is important and the pattern has changed recently. It has become more clinical, more detailed questions, but still you can get through it if you know systematically how to approach it. We know about the books we know about the resources okay this is something not new most of us are aware of it we know about the scientific basis of urology the oxford handbook of urology and the european guidelines this is something very important let's come one by one scientific basis is something which most of us don't read but this is something that the examiners are very fond of so if you have appeared for this exam before you must be knowing that there are questions picked up straight from this book Okay, you, they're straightforward. We'll look at some of the examples towards the end of this uh, video. So they pick up tables from there and they ask you questions. These are very basics, but they are so much based on general urology or embryology or your transplant that you don't revise it and you're not able to confidently answer your question. So if you look at the Oxford Handbook of Urology, this is a very important uh, book. But if most of us have been reading Campbell during our residency, during our training, and so if you have a base from the Campbell, reading Oxford becomes very easy. You can complete the whole book of 800 pages in about three to four weeks easily. And you can revise it two to three times before your actual exam. 
mark the important things, highlight the important things, the percentages are important, everything tables are important. So just highlight them on the first reading, revise it second and third time from the same highlighted things. The Oxford Handbook is also a very rich source of questions that you get. The European Guidelines 2024, if you have to answer the Euro-Oncology questions, you cannot go through any of the textbooks because none of the textbooks have updated information on the Euro-Oncology, okay? But to get the updated knowledge on Euro-Oncology, you must have a thorough reading of the European Guidelines. Section 1, Oncology questions are very, very basic, but if you have not updated your knowledge, you are not going to answer them. Okay, and reading the guidelines is not difficult. Okay, you need to have a very conceptual approach to the oncology questions. If you look at the guides, what are the common guides that is available? We are aware of this question guides. Okay, so the first one is the postgraduate urology guide by Dr. Prakar Das Gupta. There are around 200 questions on this, so you can go through them. There are some of the exam pattern like questions. Okay, the revision notes by Donati. Every chapter has 25 questions and you can go through them. They are also a rich source of MCQs. And if you go through these books by Iqbal Shergil, this is also a very rich source of questions. So you can find questions anywhere. So don't run after solving MCQs. There are a lot of resources available. Okay. You can easily find questions from there, but none of them will ever carry the repeated questions. Okay. Nobody is supposed to declare the recalls. So you need to know what are the commonly asked questions, commonly asked topics, and you have to base your knowledge based on that and you have to keep building your knowledge surrounding those topics. These guides are only going to help you in that pattern to understand what topics are important. This is something that most of us probably ignoring and uh, just because it's not very updated knowledge. It's available in the BAUS website known as Tom Walton Notes. If you go through them, there are a lot of PDF available. You can download them free of cost. I would recommend you to read at least once these uh, topics because uh, there has not been much update on andrology or planet dysfunction or uh, female urology, okay? These topics you can easily read from this once and you might find some points which uh, you might find important which you have not read it here and there. So one reading you must have, try to compile them in folders and try to keep them together so revise it from the same source every time in your first reading you're supposed to just highlight the important things second reading don't read everything just read the highlighted things let us talk about the course that we are conducting we are going to have 16 sessions we are going to have two sessions per week usually on the weekends we are going to have a comprehensive discussion. We are going to talk about all the topics that are asked in the exam. So we are going to discuss the MCQs based on those topics. Every day we are going to pick up, uh, suppose you are discussing Euro-Oncology, we are going to pick up important questions from Euro-Oncology, the controversial questions and the best way to come up with the best answer. That will be our main approach. We will try to provide you a recording at the end of class. We have been doing it previously also with the last set of candidates, we have done that. and we had a good response with them. So what are we planning to do? We are planning to discuss the latest guidelines, which is important. We should know about the European guidelines or the NICE guidelines. It's very, it becomes very difficult to read from multiple sources. We are trying to do our best to compile things, make it easy for you so that you know what to read before your exam rather than being confused with so many sources. We should not forget the exam it's not difficult, but the pass rates are low because we don't know what to read, which topics to read from where. And that can only be understood if somebody is helping you out with this, compiling them together. What we don't read sometimes is the general urology part, the embryology, the transplant. We are ignoring them. And believe me, around 40 questions out of 240 might be asked from just general urology and transplant. And that strikingly affects your pass percentage. As I said, revise every time from the same source that you're studying. Go back five to 10 years back when you're preparing for graduation or post-graduation exams. You need that amount of zeal to pass this exam. If you're thinking just an experience will be enough, experience of practice is not going to help a lot in this exam. So you need to have a knowledge, you need to have a lot of updates, okay? So if you take up this question, this table has been taken from the scientific basis of virology. If we take up this table, so this is a very important table which has been asked multiple times in the past. 
So what are they trying to say? There are 11 isoenzymes of phosphodiesterase. Okay, we are mainly talking about PD5 inhibitors. The examiners want you to know where other phosphodiesterase enzymes are present. So you must know PD6 is present in retina. PD8 and 9 are present in the GIT. These are something which have been asked in the past. Okay, so you must know this too at least. Apart from this, you must be seeing that the cyclic GMP is an important messenger in your PD5 and 6 pathway. Cyclic GMP, the rest of the cyclic AMP mediated mainly. Okay, so if you look at the sum of the questions, which are exam pattern like questions, then you must be knowing this is a PD6 and this is a PD8. Okay, and if you look at this question, then you must be understanding that this uh, PD5 inhibitors, they increase cyclic GMP. This is a straight question from the scientific basis. So this the whole purpose of discussing this is to make you understand the scientific basis is a really important book and you might not consider it that valuable, but this is very valuable when it comes to your MCQs. This is another paragraph taken from scientific basis. What are we trying to discuss in this is the potency of the PD-5 inhibitors. Okay, so if we look at the potency of the PD-5 inhibitors, this is represented by IC50. The IC50 is a representation of the potency of the drug. So what does it IC50 means? That is the amount of the drug required to inhibit 50% of the enzyme. So if the potency is more, that means less amount of drug is required to inhibit the enzyme. So the lower the IC50, more the potent the drug is. So again, if we come back to this table, which is given in the scientific basis, so this is very important to understand that it is the lowest for Vardenafil, 0.7, okay? That means the most potent of them all is the Vardenafil. The most potent PD-5 inhibitor is Vardenafil, but this data is only for in vitro, okay? This is not available. This may not be true when we talk about the in vivo data. Why? Because the in vivo, there are other factors responsible like the absorption, distribution, and the pharmacokinetics. So if you look at the absorption, this is most of the drugs are affected by fatty meal except for the tiadalafil, which is not affected by absorption, okay? Another thing that you must be aware of is the selectivity ratio that determines the side effect profile of a drug. The selectivity ratio, what does it mean? It means the potency, the IC50 ratio of PD5 to that isoenzyme. If the selectivity ratio is less, it means that the drug has a potent action on that isoenzyme as well. So if the PD if one and PD is six, they also have less values of selective ratio, it means that these drugs are going to have good potent actions on these isoenzymes and we are going to develop side effects related to PDE1 and PDE6. So that is the problem with sildenafil, why we get blue-green color blindness, okay, and visual problems. However, with tadalafil, this is very high, so the potency is very less on the PDE6, okay? So this tadalafil has the least side effects because of its less action, less potent action on the other isoenzymes. Coming to wardenafil, again, it has a good action on the PDE6, however, a very minimal action on the PDE1. So the side effect profile is maximum for sildenafil and minimum for tadalafil. If we talk about the half-life, so it is very standard term for tadalafil, we must be knowing 17.5 hours. Okay, so this is something, a paragraph, which is going to help you solve a very important question. If you look at this, wardenafil has the longest half-life of 16 hours. This is wrong. This is tadalafil has the longest half-life, okay? So absorption for tadalafil is affected by high fat. It's absolutely wrong. So for tadalafil, it is not affected at all, not affected by any medication, by any diet. Vardenafil has the highest IC50. No, it is the lowest IC50 because of the most potency of the drug. Sildenafil has a half-life of four to five hours. It's absolutely true. Tadalafil is contraindicated with Flomax. No, we, there are drugs recommended with tansalosin, with an alfuzosin, you give tadalafil. So PD-5 inhibitors are recommended in BPH for patients with persistent LUTs. Okay, so this is something that you should know how to approach this MCQs 
And that is what the whole purpose of our course will be. We'll try to make it easy for you. We'll try to make the chapters. We'll try to take, pick up the chapters and try to solve the, as much of as MCQs as possible. And we'll see, we'll come out with the best results, hopefully. If you have any doubt regarding the course, if you want to join the course, our course starts on 11th of May, that is on Saturday. Okay, so if you have any question regarding it, you can drop me an email. And thank you for your patient listening.